have you had any kind of wild stories that you've had to sort of uh turnkey just just make, oh, it, yeah. make it work? i had to do an entire basically like freestyle comedy routine because things just immediately just stopped working on stage wow. we were opening for well actually they didn't stop working the equipment literally all fell from the back of the stage onto the front of the stage a couple feet away from me wow. broke everything um because they forgot to put a carpet down underneath the stuff and it shakes wow. and it shaked all the way to the front and so now i'm just on stage opening for french montana and ti with all these people looking at me like who are you why should we care boo <laughs> you know wow. and just kind of like dish it back i grew up watching stand-up comedy and like seeing how they deal with things so that I wouldn't take it too seriously when things went wrong. Right. And that's helped tremendously. I'd suggest it to anybody else too. It just, it helps you not freak out when yep. everything goes to shit. I think one of the greatest gifts that you can have is not necessarily talent or the best voice or, or even really making really good beats. It's the ability to know when something sounds compelling which isn't as common as it sounds. I know when I sound compelling on a song and I know when someone else sounds compelling on a song. Mm -hmm. And some songs are great that I've written that I didn't release because I don't sound compelling on it. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest thing. I knew Drew Barrymore was compelling. When I wrote La La Land, uh, it was the same deal. It was just in a little acoustic song that me and my friend had wrote high in his backyard, uh, satir sat satirizing. Sat satire sounds right. uh, yes. it, it almost sounds like sodomizing so i don't like it yeah, it's, it's, satirizing yeah. hollywood and i listened to it like 30 times in the car ride home driving down maholland and i knew okay this is a compelling song no matter what becomes of it so that's that's the best way i can put it is like not not everything is meant to come out by you and some songs i have i have like over 100 songs that i just will give to somebody else one day. Why did, how did you come up with the name Drew Barrymore? Because it rhymed and it was, did you have it? Was it, there's something about her specifically and not another very famous uh, person? Like what, 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 what came with that name specifically in the name of the song? I mean, she fit, you know, it was Hollywood royalty. I was sitting in the studio. This was before I even got signed. I was still driving Lyft and working at a bar maybe in as early as 2017. And oh wow. Um, wow. and I decided to go to the studio every day. I had never really had a routine. I grew up with ADD, so it made it really hard to condense thoughts even in school and, you know, being held back a grade. Like, it, I just, I was never a quick person at anything I tried to do, but music was the passion. And I tried to create a routine for myself for the first time where I would go start the day at a certain time go to the gym, then go to the studio all day and try to make stuff and fail for about four months before the wheels started turning in the opposite direction. So I always tell people that that's like the best thing in any interview that I do, uh, read and create a routine for yourself, which a lot of creative minded people have a hard time with, you know, focusing our minds in one in one way and then at some point drew barrymore came about because i was uh I, I made this beat that was really cool and then i wrote all the verses just it was supposed to be kind of like a love story about two ghosts that just live in the same room kind of for all eternity and that was what the idea was and as it came about a couple months into finishing it I brought in a bunch of different writers to try to get what the idea for the hook is and none of it really worked. And then I heard a voice note on my phone from like five years ago where Julia Michaels, the artist and writer had said that to me in a studio session. She said, you're the next Drew Barry and I want more. And we kind of laughed and I was like, Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. You just got to be grateful. I, you know, I, like my friend literally told me, and when I went through depression, he really helped me through because I was like on the verge of like suicidal in 2020 at one point. And wow. uh, and he got me out of it because and not by like showing me so much love and telling me all the things I wanted to hear. 
He's like, you're not grateful enough. You don't have enough gratitude. And he gave me a notebook, which I have right here. Um, uh oh, did I lose it? Oh, he gave me a notebook that I have right here that uh, <clears throat> I had to start writing all the things I was grateful for every day. And um, I don't do it as much every day anymore, right. but I think about those things, uh, simple things. And I think it helps, it helped me. So I think it would help other people. We started running together every morning and I had to write even on the way there and the traffic. I'm like, I'm grateful for the palm trees because they make the traffic less crappy. Yeah. And after a while, it really started to work. And I'm a very cynical person in a lot of ways, uh, too much so. So you know, it's all, it's all hopefully to like, if someone listens to this and they have any of the same feelings yeah. as either of us to, to help, but it helped a lot. It helped a lot to remember how lucky you are in so many ways. It was on my birthday. Uh, we were in Omaha, Nebraska and my song had, they were the first city to play my song on the radio. A guy named Caleb put it on and I had still not heard it on the radio, but I went to Nebraska on my birthday for a radio show. And on the way out of Nebraska in the car with my team, we stopped at a Taco Bell and we we're drunk and high, except for the driver. And uh, and my song came on the radio right when she was handing us the bags and we threw them up and we fucked, we fucked up all the food. And, but we were like, ah, there it is. There it is. And we were high fiving, and the woman in the in the window didn't know what was going on. But we told her, "This is my song. Like this is that was uh, yeah. I'll never forget that." What year is that? That first moment. That would have been 2018. That was the first time I heard my song on the radio. So I'll take you back. I I, I went to Berkeley College of Music. I got a scholarship to go there, um, and I was there for two years. And in that two years, the Glee Project came about. Everyone at music school, especially Berkeley, any kind of music opportunity that comes around, everyone knows and everyone auditions for. Because it's not the kind of thing where you graduate and now you're a rock star. You yeah. know, you kind of have to take anything, any opportunity you can get to get out there. And the Glee Project was one of those things. They were looking for the next big Glee kid because that was the big thing at the time. I'd never watched a single episode, but I auditioned singing... Um, I like did my rendition of uh, Gold Digger by Kanye West. And uh, somehow I made it to be like one of 12 people picked for this show. So I had to choose between staying in school and taking this opportunity and see where it went. It, it was a no brainer to me. You know, my parents were scared for me, but they were always supportive. So, yeah. Um, so I left and I, went to film this thing and did a whole bunch of press and interviews all over New York and blah, blah, blah. And we, and I was the first person kicked off. They had me sing a Katy Perry song and a Bruno Mars song. And you could hear by the sound of my voice that it's pretty low toned. And I never had a very high range and that just didn't work out at all. I was the first one off, moved back home, had to work odd jobs for several years while I worked on music. And that was the Glee Project time. It was fun, though. Still friends with those guys. And what you want changes. Yes. You know, over time. It, yep. it especially makes it difficult. You know, sometimes I want just a normal life. Um, have a, I'm single now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to have kids, settle down, stay out of the limelight, do my tours. Um <clears throat> and then just like kind of have like a very medium bodied career where I'm happy and, and, you know, everyone in my life is happy and safe and all that. And then sometimes I'm like, absolutely not. Like, I want to take this as far as I can go and see right. as much of the world as I can before I die. Yep. And, and then I, and, but fine. And I wanted, sometimes you want to do both and it's like, okay, then you really got to figure out how right. the hell to manage both of those things. Yep. You know, I'm I'm impressed by anybody that can manage a great success like that. Great success. And uh and all the things that keep you grounded. Right. The thing that was good about the pandemic for me 
was I needed it. I there was a lot of stuff that I had just kept working through and hadn't dealt with. Mm -hmm. And when everything stopped, it all came crashing. I spent weeks in bed on my depression and all the things that I had been running from. I didn't feel like I had an identity um, when I wasn't on the road. And I didn't realize that I didn't have hobbies. I didn't have, you know, um, a significant other. I didn't even have a home at first. I was just renting one out of my a writer that I work with place. And I was living with young gravy, little Aaron and my buddy JP, who I write all my stuff with. In a, in a, it was like, you know, you didn't have like much space. So, um, yeah, it, it, I, I, to remain like a human being and not just another person who took off and became a star and uh, stopped being able to identify with normal people, uh, common people. Like, I think I, I think now in retrospect that that was what I personally needed.